explosion of traditional orgs. And the purpose of that evolution was to figure out who to blame when things go wrong. So it started with a train wreck in uh, Western Massachusetts, October 5th, 1841. And uh, the Western Railway hired George Whistler, a uh, husband of uh, Whistler's mother in the painting to uh, investigate. He borrowed uh, ideas from the Prussian military. They came up with silos, functional silos, departments, chains of command. Uh, but mo most importantly, the world's first org chart uh, in business and the idea of figuring out who to blame. That was the entire purpose of traditional organizations. So now we've got uh, orgs that are uh, managed the same way they were uh, as uh, the Western Railway. Um, we have massive anxiety. Uh, most uh, workers, and especially knowledge workers, spend most of their time or about half their time doing work they'd rather not do that could be better done by other people. We have unhealthy competition. We're focused on pleasing a boss who's pleasing the customer. We have dehumanizing language. Uh, we're wasting people's lives with unnecessary bureaucracy. So we know all these things. And... Um, Presumably, uh, these pathologies are driving us toward a new Cambrian explosion of a different kind of organization, decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, welcome to Web 3.0 and the DAO. Um, so DAOs are uh, clearly a way to transcend traditional bureaucracy, to get stuff done, to create value, uh, to allow people to do their best work absent the chains of command and the unnecessary uh, bureaucratic structures that impede progress. And that's all great. It does beg the question, though, are there challenges with organizing and managing and maintaining DAOs? Because in a DAO, we still have to work together. So we still have the challenge of intersubjectivity. Uh, we know ourselves as individuals. We know what we're interested in, what we're passionate about. We can know others to a degree, uh, to the degree they let us and to the degree we observe behavior, but we can't really know what's inside the mind of another person. Uh, we have to deal with intersubjectivity in order to collaborate, in order to work together. And that's a metaphysical problem. We also have to build relationships in order to collaborate and work together. And relationships are pretty fundamental to human happiness. Uh, Harvard did a, a study, a longitudinal study of 80 years. They found the most important factor in human happiness is actually relationships. So we've got to deal with these challenges in the DAO uh, no differently than we would have to in a traditional organization. And so it begs the question, uh, are we in danger of continuing to waste human capacity in the ecosystem of the DAO uh, in the same way or in the same ways that we have been wasting human capacity in traditional organizations? Is that a danger for us? Uh, so I would um, look at that question by referring to uh, an influential essay that came out in 1970 called The Tyranny of Structurelessness. And this essay was very powerful, very influential, and it basically said that a structure evolves over time. And it evolves over time in any kind of ecosystem because we have the intersubjectivity that I referenced a second ago, but also because people are not identical. They have different interests, different passions, different desires, different skills, different aptitudes. Um, so what this results in is a structure that evolves over time. And if you have an explicitly uh, structuralist organization, that structure is masked. And so certain individuals acquire power, uh, they acquire influence, uh, they, they direct things. Uh, there is a masked structure, but it is still a structure nonetheless. And what this can evolve to is uh, our subsets of elites, uh, people who are considered the ins 
uh, as opposed to the people who don't quite understand the structure and don't recognize the mass structure, and so they would be considered the outs. And the elites become friends, they become closer, uh, they share information more frequently, uh, and they sort of concretize these different sorts of silos regardless of the fact that there's a, an explicit uh, abolition of structure. So is there a way out? Is there a way to deal with this and to optimize the value creation, uh, the individual passion unleashing, and the teamwork of a DAO uh, and sort of transcend this uh, tyranny of structurelessness? Um, I would argue that there is. There is a way to do that. Um, so the way to uh, transcend the tyranny of structurelessness is to get explicit. And that's about getting explicit uh, around agreements between the content of one's participation in the organization, in this case, a DAO. Uh, what is the purpose for one's uh, attachment to a DAO? Why are you here? Uh, what is the content of your value creation work? Uh, what services are you providing? How are you accountable to fellow DAO members into the group as a whole? How is, how is authority distributed? How is it explicit? What decisions are you responsible for? Uh, are you respecting all voices in the DAO? Does everyone have a, a say in matters that affect them? How is information shared widely? And do people have access to the resources they need to contribute effectively to the DAO? So these are very important questions. Uh, they can be uh, addressed by some open patterns and practices of uh, leadership and teamwork. And specifically in, in terms of leadership, it's about switching to a, a pattern of leadership that's invitational. It's not coercive, it's not directive or assertive. It's about inviting people to join a vision of some desired future state or different approach or value stream or process or project, whatever it happens to be. It's about explicit agreements. So when we come into a, a DAO frequently, we may have a fuzzy understanding of what's going on, uh, what we can contribute, uh, where we can fit in, to what teams we could attach ourselves but getting very explicit about those things in terms of agreements by and between peers inside an ecosystem is critical to getting uh, past that tyranny of structurelessness. The explicitness itself is what's important. It's about clarity of authorization. Uh, what exactly are the decision rights for which an individual can be fully accountable? Are you the decision maker for a particular decision? Or you a co-decider for a decision? Are you the decision maker when the regular decision maker goes on vacation? Uh, is decision made by consent or by consensus or by group? Um, what is this quantum of decision making authority? Are you merely uh, asked to provide information to a decision maker? Do you require information from another person prior to making a decision? There are lots of ways, almost infinite number of ways to structure decision-making authority, what we call decision rights, clarity of authorization, explicit clarity is crucial. Uh, it's about boundary management. So what is the, what is the charter of this DAO? What is its purpose? Um, what are the principles uh, that guide it? What are the uh, rules that uh, people should not violate in terms of interaction and intersubjectivity? It's about boundary management making clear what the principles, values, mission, purpose, and other aspects of the DAO really are so that people understand them and incorporate them into their daily work. Um, it's about whole group processes, making sure that people understand what's going on to the extent possible at any given moment in time to the degree they're interested so that people aren't siloed and prevented from having access to important information that could guide their purpose and their uh, projects and their work inside the DAO. And it's about common knowledge, having a common language, a common understanding, uh, a realization uh, as a collaborative team 
uh, what we are sharing and what what we are about here in terms of a common mission. Explicitness, explicitness in terms of agreements is the way to transcend the tyranny of structurelessness. So how do I know this? Well, I have a story. So my story is uh, 32 years ago, I joined an organization, Morning Star, as Daniela mentioned. And uh, we were building a state-of-the-art uh, food technology factory. And uh, it was a, a big project. It was a $27 million project uh, 32 years ago. Today, it would be double that. I was the financial controller. We had a small core team of 24. As we started building this project, our founder brought us together and said, can we organize around very simple core principles? <clears throat> we said, sure. So we proposed uh, organizing around don't use force and keep commitments. We said, sure. Those are the most fundamental principles of human interaction. They are to human beings what gravity is to physics. Because if you imagine a world where everyone abandoned the use of force, we wouldn't need armies or navies or police or locks on our doors. And of course, that's not realistic, but that's not really the point. The point is the closer we get to that ideal state, the better off we are as human beings, the more space we open up for human happiness and intersubjectivity and teamwork and, and great results. And the other principle is people should keep the commitments they make. <laughs> Imagine a world where everyone kept the commitments they make. We wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have breaches of contract we'd have uh, uh, an amazing world. And of course, that's not realistic either, but that's not the point. The point is the closer we get to that ideal state, the better off we are as human beings. And the more space we open up for happiness, harmony, prosperity, and teamwork. And keeping commitments has quantifiable financial and economic value. Uh, if I am 100% reliable, my services are worth more to a DAO or any other organization than someone who's less reliable. So keeping commitments, don't using, not using force and coercion, core principles. Um, at the end of that meeting, we were a self-managed organization. So we went on to build the factory. Uh, July 16th, we turned the factory on and, and we produced about 90 million pounds or 45 million kilograms of industrial tomato concentrate for the world market changed the cost structure of our entire industry overnight. We did it without any bosses, a completely self-managed organization, kind of like a doubt. Um, years later, uh, we made a time-lapse video of the explicit agreements that we created between peers. So this is a picture of it. And I think I've got a movie here I can show. Let me stay here. <clears throat> so this is a time-lapse video of peers, individual peers coming together, creating explicit agreements with each other defining decision rights, defining, defining personal commercial mission statements, of why are we here, defining our services that we propose to provide, the scope and quantum of decision rights, measures, metrics, how we wanna to work together, all those things. <clears throat> it's a dynamic org chart, it's not static because we were fully autonomous. We were free to negotiate and renegotiate roles and responsibilities at all times. It never stops. A few years ago, we took, uh, uh, as our company expanded and grew uh, from one factory to two factories to three factories and expanded up and down the supply chain uh, toward customers and remote warehouses across North America and toward the supply in terms of farming, harvesting, transplanting, and trucking. Uh, these agreements expanded, of course. And so we took a picture of those. We had this picture taken at a computer lab at the University of California, Davis. 
and uh, they projected our, our org chart in three-dimensional space. Uh, we believe this is uh, infinitely expandable, no limits. These are explicit agreements by and between self-managed individuals, none of whom is a boss, none of whom has any command authority whatsoever, working together around a common mission to create value for the world. Uh, I showed this chart to uh, a biotech exec a few weeks ago, and he said, you know what, you're showing me you're showing me a molecule because in biotech, what we do is we engineer molecules. He said, we move uh, atoms around one atom at a time. And he said, we have two goals in biotech. One is to make the connections uh, in the molecule less toxic. And we do that by adding nitrogen atoms. Uh, and, um, the other goal is to make the covalent bonds between the atoms stronger. He said, isn't that what we're trying to do with human organizations? <laughs> we're trying to make them stronger bonds. It's exactly what we're trying to do. And so uh, I found that a uh, very interesting uh, observation on the part of that uh, particular gentleman. Uh, so we have a tool that we've used uh, and have refined over the years, a tool at, at Morningstar is called a colleague letter of understanding. That's just the uh, technical name for the peer contract or peer agreement. Uh, I've been playing with a, a canvas that I've developed over the last uh, five or six years. So here's a, here's a copy of that. Um, this is uh, now copyrighted on the uh, Creative Commons uh, 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 site and uh, I have uh, made it available as a downloadable um, uh, graphic on, on my website. Um, in my original conversations with Daniello and his colleagues, I um, suggested that, you know, we could use a form of this to um, work with DAOs and develop explicit agreements by and between peers uh, within DAOs, defining the who, what, why, when, where, and how of work, and to uh, achieve that clarity and explicitness of understanding that will allow people to really do their best work. And this could be a, an onboarding tool, because what's it like when someone joins a DAO? Or are they really clear when they join the DAO about where they're going to engage and how they're going to hop onto the merry-go-round and start creating value? Or is it a little bit fuzzy, a little bit messy, and, and maybe we're wasting some human capacity there? So maybe there's an opportunity here to uh, facilitate some peer agreements inside DAOs and create environments where people get up to speed quickly and uh, really engage with others. Uh, others have great teamwork and start creating value uh, as soon as possible. So with that, I'll tap the brakes and uh, we're at 25 after and, and uh, just happy to dialogue. Thanks. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Doug, for, for that framing. If, if anyone would like to, to comment, uh, you can raise your hand. The button is in the middle and I'll pass you the word. Uh, Ray, please. And then uh, Matt. Uh, you know, thank you, Doug. Uh, super enlightening and so grateful that you have posted stuff on creative commons for everyone to kind of interact with so amazing um question did you notice any interesting power dynamics in this new way of working i'm specifically interested in new folks entering into this way of working where existing folks might be familiar and did you notice like that they might have struggled to create contracts with coworkers who had been in the system for longer. Um, that's interesting. What I, what I actually notice more are our new colleagues uh, who enter the system, who are brought in for uh, a particular type of subject matter expertise, 
who um, are unable to shed their uh, power orientation and enter a self-managed ecosystem. And so um, what, what happens if they can't orient themselves relatively quickly, uh, they try to exercise power that they don't have and people start to tune them out. So the culture I would say is self-healing and self-correcting. Uh, so the culture cures that pretty quickly. Um, I've seen people that um, try to exercise power, they would call meetings, no one would show up because they didn't respect the person calling the meeting. And that was, you know, they were free to do so. Matt? You're still muted in case you're talking. Oh, sorry. What, uh, with these interpartner inter agreements, that chart looked really big. I'm kind of curious, like, who did everybody have an agreement with everybody or was it siloed somewhat? And then what was made explicit in those agreements? Uh, thank you. Not, no, everyone doesn't uh, connect with everyone. So uh, it is a, a completely autonomous, self-managed, self-selecting system. So people are hired to do certain things, of course. So if we hire, for example, an industrial electrician, they're responsible for uh, motor control centers and wiring and, and uh, motors and things like that. Um, and so there is a subset of colleagues with whom they work most often. Uh, what we found was that people tend to... Uh, self-select and connect and form a, explicit agreements with about seven to 12 fellow colleagues with whom they interact most often. Uh, there's no limit. There, there, there's no uh, rule that says you can't uh, connect with more colleagues or fewer colleagues. It is completely self-selecting, self-regulating, but people tend to connect with seven to 12 fellow colleagues and these are the people with who, whom they work most directly uh, and also people who may be just upstream or just downstream in the value creation process. Got it. And could you say a little bit about the form that those agreements take? Right. So the, the content, I think, is... Uh, <clears throat> pretty well captured here on the, on the canvas. So it starts with um, what we call it, a, a Morningstar calls a personal commercial mission. Uh, this canvas is designed to be more generic and uh, open to other companies. So it's why are you here? So why do you choose to come to work here every day? What does excellence look like in your role? How does what you do support the mission, vision, values, and purposes of the overall enterprise. Why are you here? That's the, that's the starting point. Um, we start with why, as Simon Sinek would say. And then we go to uh, what? What are your services? So what exactly do you uh, do here uh, to create value uh, for the customer? And with respect to those services, um, to what degree are those do those services represent management? Uh, because the reason we we call self management self management is because everybody's a manager. You know, some people think that uh, self management means no managers. That's quite wrong. Self management means everyone is a manager uh, to the degree they're interested and capable. And management uh, is not rocket science. It's just planning, organizing, controlling, selecting, coordinating. We all do that all the time in our own personal lives. So we simply extend that logic to the workplace and realize that everyone is a manager. And then for each of the services, uh, what is the scope and quantum of one's personal decision-making authority? I touched a little bit on that uh, earlier. So are you the sole decision maker or is there some other definition uh, of decision making that pertains to a particular decision? 
in some decisions you can uh, you can uh, identify in advance that they may be uh, continuous, recurring, ongoing uh, decisions. Um, the business itself, that or the DAO itself, uh, really determines and defines what decisions have to be made. Um, then there are long-term uh, uh, strategic uh, decisions that can make or break an organization. And generally speaking, a big company, those are best in a CEO or a board of directors. Uh, but uh, all other management decisions that belong in the ecosystem with one or more individuals. And so how do you make those decisions and what are they? You know, that's really crucial to figure out. And that's a huge untapped opportunity. I mean, this is where DAOs can race ahead of traditional orgs because many, if not most traditional orgs are sloppy about the way they identify decision rights. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a great opportunity for, for clarity and explicitness. Um, and then we can get in, we get into uh, measurements. So how do you know you're doing a good job if you're in a self-managed org? Uh, there's no boss walking around telling you if you're doing a good job or not. Uh, you have to be able to tell yourself. So how do you do that? Uh, what kind of measures, metrics, OKRs uh, do you employ to define your own personal uh, delivery of value? What resources do you need? You need a pickup truck or a laptop or you know an office or what exactly do you need to fulfill your purpose? Um, another reason this this uh, contract works so well is because it's not just a technical services agreement; it's also a social contract. It's about how do I want people to work with me? Uh, what motivates me? Uh, who do I relate to? Um, how do I manage conflict? How do I resolve differences of opinion? All these aspects of, of social interaction are also crucial to success in an ecosystem. So it's both left-brained and right-brained, and that's why it works. We get explicit about both the social aspects and the technical aspects. So the who, what, why, when, where, and how in, in, in a nutshell is what the content is for these agreements. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, Ray, checking, is your point, uh, you know, the symbols directly on this one or <laughs> anyone, uh, by the way, for everyone who has the camera, um, I unfortunately cannot do it quite well for the others, but if you have, if you wanna directly comment on the current thread of conversation, you can use this sign and if you want to start a new thread of conversation, you can use these signs. So I'll try to follow the the, ra the raise hand uh, Google functionality as, as much as possible. But whenever I see one of these, I'll I'll give it priority over the other. So uh, Ray, please. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Doug, I'm looking at the canvas, and in my head, I initially thought, okay, this is something that an individual would do. But now I'm thinking, no, it feels like there's something a group of people come together and complete as a as a unit. Is that the right way? Exactly looking? right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly right. Pod team, uh, group, whatever. How do those teams form? Is, is it just like you, or is there? Did you notice any trends in how those those teams formed? Well, it's. Uh, it's uh, Interesting. In a in a uh, continuous flow process uh, manufacturer like Morningstar, it's it's somewhat defined by the process itself. So there are, there are discrete um, process elements uh, where groups of people naturally work together uh, to create a product uh, for sale. So in in that kind of an org, it's a little bit predefined. Uh, in, in a DAO or a, 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 a consultancy or a law firm or some other kind of org, um, people would have to think through, you know, okay, how are we going to come together to form these agreements and, and what does a pod definition look like in this kind of an org? So that's going to be, uh, that's going to be one of the challenges for sure. Uh, Paulo, and then uh, I'll go. 
Um, thank you so much for presenting this, first of all. Um, I, I'm curious about um, how does this influence uh, compensation of people? Um, and this is always the, you know, hard question, I guess. Um, but um, uh, have you, have you, uh, can you share any learnings on how maybe the representation, the influence, the amount of decision rights, whatever it is that influences the compensation of people in the organization? Yeah. Compensation. And again, it's a, a, a continuous flow manufacturer to uh, um, a DAO creating software, for example. Um, but people are hired uh, initially for their subject matter expertise into a particular geographic location. And so in that case, we know almost exactly what the, uh, what the compensation should be to attract a particular level of talent to this geographic location um now people are hired at that level plus a premium and the premium represents the fact that and that premium could be 10 or 15 percent representing the fact that every single person is a manager so uh, uh an industrial electrician is not just hired to to uh work on electricity uh, they're involved in uh, budgeting and hiring and strategy and coordination and all the elements of traditional management. Why? Because there are no managers. They are responsible. And in this, uh, this, this case, in Morningstar's case, um, people, uh, individual mechanics, for example, uh, could be responsible as individuals for... 15 to $20 million worth of equipment, all aspects, including strategy, um, which is a, a, in some cases a much greater quantum of leadership responsibility than a, a CEO of a small company. And uh, many of them have uh, uh, only a high school diploma, but they're the best in the world at what they do, which is a very narrow specialty. So they're hired at this specific level. Um, at the end of every year, um, uh, each uh, geographic location forms uh, a compensation committee. It's a representative committee uh, composed of representatives from all aspects of the organization. So they're representatives from finance and distribution and marketing and sales and admin and, and uh, production and all the rest. And uh, they get together as a representative committee and they look at the uh, results uh, of each and every individual associated with that location. And uh, if, a, if an individual contributor wants um, and by the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, then they have to make a business case for it, a, a bona fide you know, business school type business case and sell it to the committee. And uh, they can get help with that. I mean, there are lots of finance colleagues who are happy to help out with that uh, and create a business case. And so then it's a negotiation. Um, so they enter in a, into a negotiation with the committee. And uh, sometimes the committee accepts the business case uh, outright. But sometimes they negotiate a, a lower uh, increase. Sometimes they negotiate down to where the cost of living increase is. Uh, sometimes the committee gives people increases that they haven't asked for, because sometimes people are too modest about their own achievements and accomplishments and value creation. So it's uh, it's a kind of a, a beautiful negotiation. It happens once a year. Um, and negotiation is also how these peer agreements are formed in the first place. These are these are the results of negotiation. So um, it's about agency on the part of individuals, autonomy, freedom. Uh, there are no inherent barriers uh, in this network. Uh, anyone can talk to anyone else at any, about anything at any time. Uh, and so it's about freedom to do one's best work. 
And uh, so I'd like to think that if a, if a, a giant, uh, noisy, uh, dusty, uh, uh, loud, uh, uh, sprawling manufacturing agricultural facility can figure out how to organize like a neural network, I'd really like to think that a DAO could too. Pablo? Yeah, I, I, I also hope so. Um, <laughs> can, uh, can I just uh, follow up with a, a couple of questions, which is, is the committee elected in any way? Or is it appointed or chosen by whatever mechanism? And does it, uh, does it fire people? Um, so those are, those are uh, does the committee fire people from the committee, you mean? Or can people yeah. be fired in general? Or, or, or how people are fired. Yeah. Okay, great. Two questions. So the committee, uh, three factories, the three factories uh, select committee members um, in completely different ways. Uh, I think one factory asks for volunteers. Uh, one factory, I think, has elections. I think the other factory um, uh, gave decision rights uh, to one person to appoint members. So, um, yeah, whatever works, right? And then uh, in terms of firing, uh, so re recall the first principle of self-management, um, no use of force. No, that means no coercion. No use of force means zero, zero command authority. That means no one has any authority to tell another person to start doing X and stop doing Y. It means no one has any authority to unilaterally terminate the employment of another person. Everything is accomplished by request and response. Now, anyone can make a request of anyone else at any time. And the person of whom a request is made has a professional obligation to respond to the request, but it is a request only no one can fire anyone else. Hmm. I'm tempted to ask, I'm tempted to ask uh, uh, if there was any fires, firings, and if so people were, had been requested to leave or how oh, did yeah, that happen? Yeah, oh, yeah, all the, yeah absolutely. Um, because anyone can make a request of anyone else, if if uh, I, as a colleague, uh, observe unethical behavior or uh, poor performance to the point of destructive performance or a combination thereof, I can ask another person to leave. And I have, and other people have as well. And uh, uh, so there is a process uh, called gaining agreement. And so if the person... Um, agrees with the request and that's happened. I mean, people have been asked to leave and they said, yeah, you're right, I should leave. My head's not in this anymore, I, bye, I'm leaving. Um, or they can negotiate some third option that neither party had proposed initially. So um, I see someone uh, engaged in uh, a, an unsafe act at work I may ask them to uh, to leave and they may say, well, you know, I made a mistake, but could I take uh, a, a safety class and, instead and, and prove my uh, that I've learned my lesson? Okay, I might agree to that. Now, if I think the person really should leave uh, and the person uh, uh, declines my request to leave and I still believe in my request, I can escalate the request. So we'll bring in a third party mediator, could be any other colleague, still everything's at the colleague level. Uh, their job is just to listen to both sides, offer their best advice. Uh, if at the end of that process, uh, I still believe in the request, the person still disagrees with the request, then I can escalate it again. I can escalate it to a panel of colleagues and their job is the same, identical, to the initial third party colleague to listen to both sides and offer their best advice. Um, and if the, at the end of that process, um, I still believe in the request, the person declines the request, then I can escalate it to the final step, which is uh, binding arbitration. 
So um, th what this results in is uh, what we call exhaustive due process. It means no one can be railroaded. Uh, it it uh, is a, a big damper on uh, interpersonal politics and uh, destructive interpersonal conflict. It's, it's not easy to um, uh, get rid of people, but it's absolutely possible to exit people that need to leave. And that happens every year, um, probably several times a year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, I'm going to build on a question that Ray put in the chat, where he was asking if the, the nodes in the visual that you were displaying, whether they were, they were teams, um, and perhaps I, I guess I'm, f I'm feeling some confusion as to how much the agreements work between individuals. Uh, let's say me, Ray, and Paolo, we're part of two different teams uh, in different configurations. So do we make the agreements one-on-one -on -one, or do we make it between the three of us or, um, yeah. And th that's kind of, I guess, the, a little bit the, the confusion that I have, uh, perhaps also what, what Ray is touching upon of how does these, uh, these work and, and also like related to the resources. Mm -hmm. So the, the organization itself and its culture will, um, dictate what makes sense in terms of relatedness of teams. I can tell you at Morningstar, um, but the, this org chart, there, there are a lot of teams uh, in this org chart that are, are not represented on this org chart. So there are, um, for example, uh, uh, councils, packaging councils and uh, agricultural councils and legal councils and human resources councils and various groups that are just not represented on the org chart because that org chart uh, is, are, represents individual connections between people who work most closely together. So those, those teams uh, have agreements, uh, team agreements within their teams. In addition to the colleague letter of understanding, those are our team agreements. And then teams can have agreements with other teams. So we can have service level agreements by and between teams. So there, there are no limits to the kinds of agreements and the number of team agreements that you can institute in this e ecosystem it's really whatever makes sense and if you have two teams and they need to come to an agreement it's not always necessary to have all team members of both teams together to hammer out the agreement a team can designate uh, one person and vest that person with decision rights to reach a reasonable agreement with another team or other teams so uh, kind of the uh, fluidity of this is about the uh, agency and autonomy and freedom that people have to organize and self-organize in ways that make sense for whatever their org happens to be. Thank you. Um, Stephen was asking, are there copies of Governance Doc we can review or what the, the process for creating governance procedures and documents? So the, uh, the governance document um, started, uh, it was proposed in, uh, in March of 1990, 32 years ago. Uh, it was two pages. It included the principles and the, um, the gaining agreement process that I outlined uh, and a few other points. Um, we have, uh, it, it's a, uh, the proposal or the changes in governance have been uh, extremely minor over the course of 32 years, um, kind of relying on DHOC's principle. So DHOC was the founder of Visa. He said that um, complex rules cause uh, simple, stupid behavior. Simple rules allow for complex, intelligent behavior. So really the real governance of, of Morningstar is embedded in those two principles that I articulated. Don't use force and keep commitments. Now the gaining agreement process, because um, people will have conflict and differences of opinion, there must be a way to resolve those. 
Um, and we, we've tweaked that over the years. And the way that happens is that um, one or, or more people will propose a change and then everyone gets to review the change and approve the change. And so um, it's not just, it's not just um, uh, promulgated or imposed on, uh, on the organization. It's like, what well, we're thinking about um, increasing the size of the mediation panel in the gaining agreement process from seven to 10. What do you think? Okay. And people get a chance to weigh in on that. Um, but governance, uh, bedrock governance uh, is those two principles. And uh, the other um, elements of that, gaining agreement, um, very little change, but um, when it does change, it's because of widespread input from everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrea? Yes, I, uh, Doug, there was a comment around what's the difference between the self organizing um, canvas or self management canvas and like a business canvas that is out there um, that th which you and I have talked about before. I thought it'd be helpful for the group to just understand the difference between self management canvas and something a traditional top down org could fill out in line with the business org canvas. Right. So the one that comes to mind uh, is the business model canvas, the famous one. And um, so uh, the self-management canvas is really about uh, how we work together. Uh, the business model canvas, as I recall, has to do a lot with customers and markets and strategy and the actual uh, um, how do you ensure um, financial and economic success of your business. Um, this really doesn't address that at all. This is about um, who we work with, how we work together, and uh, how we allocate our roles and responsibilities and, and decision making in a nutshell. Thank you. Uh, Matt? Yeah, I'm curious about, you talked about being explicit about who can make decisions and there were a lot of little variations on types of decisions and decision theory. And I'm thinking about with an existing organization where those kinds of, it's like implicit and not well-defined, but maybe understood. Would you have any suggestions for extracting and documenting those, like, where would you start with trying to become explicit about decisions? Yeah, I'd start with a team. Um, and um, I, I would, uh, I would have a, a little uh, small group uh, brainstorm about well, what are the, what are the important decisions that we make here? I would try to identify them. Uh, and then I'd take them, uh, uh, maybe rank them with dot voting and uh and prioritize them and then uh, go down the list and say well who, who should make the this decision and how should they make it and i would have some uh dialogue around every major decision to try and extract from people uh, who should make it and how there's a there's a, a nice uh exercise uh, from Jurgen Apello called delegation poker i think you could adapt that to decision rights poker and figure out that we make it by consent by consensus so we have co uh, decision makers um, do we need information from others first uh, do we make it and then inform you know what's the sequence of events there are, there are so many ways to make decisions and uh, if people don't agree on those ways that's a big source of conflict and, and power players, people, uh, and bureaucrats that like to, to play power politics, they love the ambiguity because then they can weigh in on everything and it makes them feel feel good. But uh, it's not great for uh, getting stuff done. Yeah, it, it occurs to me that if I had a small group to decide on decisions, 
I would then need everybody to agree that my decision about decisions is the decision. And then watching when other, like if somebody decides, I don't know, we're getting into power and authority conversation here. I guess you need, you have a way to get buy-in with everybody in the group once you've articulated some of these things, or is it still a consensus model in the end? Like everybody has to agree before this stuff becomes solid. No, it, 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 it shouldn't be a consensus model necessarily. Um, I mean, it could be if that makes sense, but, um, I mean, the fastest way to make a decision is for one person to just make the decision. You know, you have uh, one brain and neurons and they make the decision and that's the, the most efficient way to make it, but it may not be the best way depending on the decision. Um, so that's why you need uh, probably need a facilitated conversation uh, with some brainstorming and some uh, dialogue to, to get to the nub of those questions. Thanks. Paula? Um, yeah, I mean, it looks like we are almost out of time. Uh, so, um, uh, what I have to ask assumes that we um, maybe were born with this mindset of being self managed, but we're, you know, drilled down and hammered down a, a traditional corporate culture into us. Um, and uh, my question is uh, do you have tips for us to unlearn uh, top down management and start to be open to self management? Sorry, Paulo, I, uh, my computer glitched a little bit on your the last part of your question. What was that again? Uh, if uh, if you have tips uh, for us to unlearn and learn top down management and start to be open to learn self management. Well, um, one uh, one company I worked with, uh, they started a book club, so you could start a virtual book club and uh, get a hold of some uh, uh, great books. So um, um, Humanocracy, uh, Gary Hamill and Michaela Zanini, uh, they make a, a powerful case for self-management. Um, I, I read philosophy. So I read uh, Peter Block and Peter Kestenbaum. Uh, they wrote a great book called uh, Freedom and Accountability at Work. Uh, that's this one right here. Um, because ultimately it's really, uh, it's really philosophy uh, at the heart of this. What does it mean to be a successful Tao? What does it mean to be a successful human being? Um, what does it mean to be happy? Uh, those are big questions that uh, people, I hope start asking because um, you know, this is, uh, this is bigger than, than just, you know, making more money or doing better business or, you know, improving a product or a service. We're trying to, you know, create a better world, I'd like to think. So uh, I'd start a book and read some of these important books and uh, have fun with that. That's a good way to start. Another reminder of Barry O'Reilly's book, Doug, um, called Unlearn. So that's Perfect. one other book we'd, we'd recommend. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for, for participating. This has been a, a very, very stimulating conversation. Thanks a lot, Doug, for, for sharing all your knowledge and wisdom and also for everyone else who has chipped, uh, chipped in and enriched this conversation. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I'm leaving in the in the chat. We have a, another event that maybe some of you might be interested with Graham Spencer next week. Uh, he wrote about anti-captures and how anti-captures, so how DAOs can perhaps be an organizational form that resist uh, capture of interest by a, by an elite or a small group uh, that essentially takes power away from from the others to use it for their selfish benefit rather than the good of the collective so he's going to be sharing about a framework like a bit of a theoretical framework and a discussion that we have ar around this if you wanna uh, i also share the uh Arendelle twitter where we'll be sharing a little bit more about these things and some other stuff that we're doing 
and uh, Doug, I don't know if you would accept to perhaps join in our in our Discord. I can uh, share you the link, and I'll I'll put it here. Uh, I'm going to share the the one, uh, five minute summary that we that we have on on our endow for those who are not familiar. But at the bottom of this document, you can find a link to join the Discord, and and there in our learning and discussion channel. Uh, we can continue the conversation. Uh, Doug, of course, you've been already very generous with your time, so it's completely optional, but uh, for for certainly I'll be there uh, and I have a few more things to discuss. Now we need to to stop. We have another workshop starting but and our time is up. Uh, but thanks again, everyone. This has been fantastic and have a lovely rest of the day, you all. Bye. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.